I'm Peter Gallison. I'm the Joseph Pellegrino University professor here at Harvard. I teach in history of science, physics, and in visual and environmental studies, a combination of filmmaking and history of science. My biggest interest is in the relationship between very material things, machines, instruments, and the most abstract ideas that we know about. For example, I'm interested in how Albert Einstein came to his idea about time coordination, about simultaneity, that was so central to his development of special relativity. In 1905, Einstein published his paper on relativity, and it became the most famous paper in all of physics for a century. In it, he demanded that the laws of physics look the same in every frame of reference. And he had an idea about how to start that. He knew that the speed of light was something that was absolute, that nobody ever saw a light moving in a vacuum at any speed other than 186,000 miles in a second. And he knew that he wanted the laws of physics to be really the same, no matter what frame of reference you happen to be in, as long as you were moving at a constant speed. But he came to a problem. And the problem was, what do we mean when we say two events are simultaneous? So for a long time, I wondered where that idea came from as the, as the central, where that question came from. What, did he, what was he getting at by saying that that was what was wrong with his thinking through the problem? And he'd been worrying about aspects of this since the time he was 16. So here he was, he's 26 years old, working in a patent office in Bern, Switzerland. And I began to wonder, where would a patent officer thinking about electrical and, ma and magnetic things get the idea to focus on simultaneity? Well, it turns out that synchronizing clocks was a huge problem around the turn of the century, late 1800s, early 1900s. And the new methods for coordinating those clocks were something that a patent officer would see almost every day. For example, the railroads desperately needed to be able to send signals to coordinate their clocks for two reasons. One, many railroads traveled on, rail, my, many trains traveled on single tracks, and so one had to get out of the way on a shunt track in order for another one to pass, and they better know when that's happening or they could crash, and there were some terrible accidents for, by unsynchronized clocks. But more generally, the trains needed to coordinate clocks because when you traveled long distances, you needed to know what time it was. Back in the United States, there were hundreds of time zones. Every little village had a jeweler who would set the noonday clock to the high point of the sun. So when you arrived in a town going across the country, say, from New York to Chicago, Whose time were you on when you changed trains? Were you on New York time, Chicago time, the town time that you happened to be stopping in to change trains? So coordinating clocks became a big problem. And in fact, Harvard actually ran a little company that sold time. In their observatories, they would take exact measurement of the stars and figure out and the planets and figure out exactly what time it was and then signal electrically down telegraph lines that the university owned to the central train switching yards in Boston. And then telegraph lines would follow every train line as they went out all across New England. And these would synchronize electrically all the clocks along the way. But even that wasn't the only reason for wanting to be able to synchronize time back in the late 19th century. Einstein had one of his colleagues, a very senior person that he only met once, as far as I know, named Henri Poincaré, a great French mathematician, physicist, writer. He was head of the Academy of Letters and the Academy of Sciences. He was as famous and important uh, figure in French society at the end of the 19th century as, as anyone could be. Well, Poincaré was, among his other duties, in charge of the Bureau of Longitude. The Bureau of Longitude seems like a pretty arcane thing. Why would a great mathematician be doing that? But it was a very big problem. You, you could know how far south you were, the latitude, by in the northern hemisphere simply saying, where's the North Star? 
If it's right above, I'm at the North Pole. If it's at the equator, I'm at the equator. If it's in between, as it is in Boston, Massachusetts, then you could judge by just sighting the North Star. It always seems to occupy the same place in the sky. But longitude's different. We can't just look up and say what star is above us because the Earth turns on its axis and so the stars appear to rotate around the North Star. So what do you do? Well, one thing you could do would be to see how many hours difference or how many minutes or how many seconds different you are from, say, a fixed point like Greenwich, England. And if you determine, for instance, that Boston was six hours off from Berlin, then you're a quarter of the way around the world. If, it's, if our noon is six hours off from noon in uh, eight hours off from, from between Boston and Berlin, then you're a third of the way around the world. So if you know what time it is at some reference point, and you know what time it is where you are, then you can figure out how far east or west you are. You can figure out your longitude. And you needed this to lay tracks of trains, and you needed this to do navigation, and you needed this to divide up land. You Defining latitude and longitude were essential problems for the world especially in a newly and more elaborately connected world of shipping and trade and exchange that was developing in the late 19th century. So Poincaré was in charge of this effort to send signals back and forth that would tell what time it was somewhere else. So if you were high up in the Andes, they would drag telegraph lines all the way down to the sea and run undersea cables all the way back to to Paris and send a signal and say, now it's noon in Paris. And you could see exactly what time it was where you were by measuring the position of the stars, the apparent position of the stars, and determine how the longitudinal difference. So simultaneity was crucial for all these reasons, for keeping trains from crashing, for coordinating train schedules so you could get around in a newly train-connected world, for dividing up longitude, for making a map of the world, essentially, and connecting things up by this vast grid of telegraph lines that was beginning to encircle the world, a kind of 19th century internet by cable. And that was a crucial moment for simultaneity. And suddenly, simultaneity was a very practical question that the greatest scientists in the world were worried about. And Poincaré, in particular, at the end of the 19th century, said, you know, this idea of exchanging a signal, sending a signal, say, from Paris to Brazil and round trip and saying it takes this fraction of a second, and so we know it takes, say, 20th of a second to get to Brazil. Well, this was crucial, because then you could even get more accurate. You could say, not only I'm sending this signal at noon, but you could say, when you get it in Brazil, you should, set, you should know that Paris time is noon plus, say, a 20th of a second. Because it took time to get there, and you have to take that into account. Well, this simple idea that the world needed to be connected by cables, and you would send signals back and forth and coordinate clocks in this way, was used by Poincaré to define the very meaning of simultaneity. He said, what do we mean by this? Is the world functioning under an absolute time? Is there a time that's everywhere the same? No, he said. Simultaneity is just when two clocks say the same thing after having been corrected by exchanging signals between them. And Einstein developed some, an idea very much like that. So this simple idea became crucial. And in fact, in May of 1905, Einstein was walking with a friend in the hills above Bern, Switzerland, and he said, you know, the problem that I've been working on, the problem of relativity, I've been working on it for ages, and I haven't been able to finish my thought about it, but now I know what to do. And what you need to do is to take into account that simultaneous clocks need to be set up by exchanging signals. Suppose you wanted to coordinate a clock over there in Bern, a big clock tower, with the clock tower in Muri, the aristocratic suburb, some miles out, and he pointed to them both, and he said, well, send a signal and bounce it back. And then you'll know how long the round trip takes. And then you'll know what a one-way trip would take. So now you can set your clock. You say, send the signal at 12 o'clock from Bern, and when you get it at Murray, you say, I need to set my clock at 12 o'clock plus the time it takes to get there. 
And then he could write the paper. He finished that paper and suddenly was launched into this world of relativity. It got corrected as time went on. He added general relativity. And now it's part of our world. It transformed painting and architecture, poetry, Every modern poet, William Carlos Williams and E. Cummings began to write about it. Uh, Buckminster Fuller began to talk about relativity in the, in the 1920s. This was something that was a major event in culture, but not just culture. When you, when you take a, your cell phone out and you turn on the GPS, you're checking Einstein's work. You're saying to yourself, I'm here and here's where I'm going, that would stop functioning in a matter of seconds if general relativity and special relativity weren't right. So that work, it somehow came out of Einstein's physics and philosophy and practical work in the patent office, now is part of just getting around town. <laughs>